Hello, and welcome to today's daily study. Today we're going to be reading the first part of chapter 7 in the book of John. And the reason why I wanted to go back to this is because Jesus has a really good example here of how we interact with our family. Here Jesus is talking with his his brethren and his immediate family, so his half-brothers, his sisters, his, his family in that area. And they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And this goes back to something we talked about a couple weeks ago, where sometimes we have family members that have very important callings and responsibilities. And sometimes if we lack personal faith, then we can sit there and excuse ourselves for not supporting or sustaining them in what they're doing. So, one of the problems here is the fact that Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah, and his family's close proximity to him, so seeing him grow up, seeing how he was from childhood through adulthood, even though Christ showed obvious signs of divinity, you know, the teaching of the temple, growing uh, grace by grace. And we, we see that that really wasn't enough of a testimony for his siblings and, well, half-siblings and other family members to really give them enough of a testimony. <clears throat> and this is a good, I guess, warning for us as members of the church about how we view our testimony. Like, our testimony has to be based in something. The people that we see in general conference on um, every six months, the people that we read about in the church news, the apostles, the prophets, and whatnot, they all started out as babies, grew to adulthood, People knew them, people grew up around them, they made mistakes, they went to school, maybe they didn't get perfect grades. These are people, these are humans that Heavenly Father is manifesting his power through. Now, Jesus Christ was not strictly human, he was only half human. The other part was divine, like he was half God, you know. Um, but we see here that when people know these people as they grow up, when they know who they are, it becomes more difficult to receive the testimony of what they can become or what they, what they truly are, what Heavenly Father has called them to be. And so uh, we start out for here. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry. Um, so Jewry is how John refers to the, the cities of the Jews that uh, Christ was, was a part of. Anyway, because the Jews had sought to kill him, uh, or because the Jews had sought to kill him, so he didn't want to go around the cities where, like, the Judaic culture was, the Israelites, because they kept trying to kill him, obviously. Now the Jew, now for the, the Jews, the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand, and this was a feast where uh, people would build small little huts, or, or uh, they would call them tabernacles, for worshiping. And uh, this is kind of on the Mount of Transfiguration when you see Peter saying, should we build... Uh, a tabernacle here, one for Moses, one for you, and one for, for Elijah. And like he didn't really understand the purpose of uh, worshiping Christ only. But th that was the idea, that there were these little areas that you could set up to worship in a specific way. And so his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see thy works, may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. Thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe him. So that qualifying verse there, the verse five, shows us that his brethren weren't actually super concerned that other people knew that he was the Messiah. No, they, they kind of wanted him to 
not be around them. And this could be because maybe they had guilty consciences because they couldn't measure up to Christ, as no man can. And that's a kind of a legitimate thought for them. Imagine growing up with Christ as your older brother. Imagine growing up seeing his perfect example and you as just a human don't have the ability to be as perfect or capable as he is. I mean, I imagine on one hand, it would be quite an amazing experience to see Christ growing up during a time in which the entirety of the rest of humankind has very little information. Like you have information there that almost nobody else does. And then, uh, but as well, seeing that example and, and, you know, having human faults. So, but Christ was there for them as well. Like he suffered his atonement so that his brothers and sisters could as well uh, be forgiven and return to live with our Heavenly Father. And so, uh, here they're saying that there is no man that doeth anything in secret. In other words, there is no good man. There is no uh, righteous or or correct person who doesn't go out and, and preach and doesn't go out and teach these things. Of course, Christ was teaching and preaching openly before. And so here they're, they're kind of just say, basically saying, you know, we want to get rid of you for now. Like, we, we don't want to be associated with you or around you at this point. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. So, in other words, he's like, My time to go up to the feast at this moment is not yet, but you guys are ready. You can go. And so... uh the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. And he's explaining to them why he's not going out in the open right now. is because people in Israel, in Jerusalem, want to kill him because they hate him because he testifies of the evil works of Jerusalem. As go ye up unto this feast, I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. In other words, it is not time for me to go up and participate in this feast just yet. So you guys go ahead and we'll, we'll meet up there or we'll see each other there, basically. Um, though there's no record that Christ ever did meet up with his brothers at the feast. But... Uh, he is saying that, you know, if you're so embarrassed by me, if you're so worried about me, you guys go up. You, you're already ready. You don't have anything to worry about going into Jerusalem. So you guys go ahead, and when my time has come, I will go up and, and do what I need to there. So, and then he goes on and he says, uh, But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. And the important qualifier here is the as it were. So he is being secretive about going into the feast, but he is not there in secret. He's not hiding himself. He's just not making himself public as he goes to the feast. So... um. Then the Jews saw him at the feast and said, where is he? So when he was up there, when he was going up to the feast, the people in Jerusalem were looking for Christ because, I mean, obviously he is the most famous figure in Jerusalem at that particular moment. You had the leaders worrying about him and constantly talking against him. You had lawyers and scribes constantly hanging around him, trying to trip him up. Yeah, he was the most famous character in Jerusalem at that time. And so everyone was was kind of in secret talking with each other about what, what Christ was about. Like, where was he in, during this important feast? And so, uh, and there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, he is a good man. And others say, nay, but he deceiveth the people. In other words, there were some people who are like, he's, he's a good person. He teaches good things. And then another that says that he's a fraud. Like he's basically doing it for himself. He has his own 
purpose to uh, to do these things. And we can kind of imagine the the uh, I guess personalities of each of those people. And that's not to say that there's any problem in being skeptical of any person's claims. But when a person manifests the miracles that Christ had manifested on multiple occasions in front of everyone out in the open, taught like Christ had taught, then it is one of those things that you don't really have any reason besides your own personal pride to then doubt that what Christ says is, is therefore true. Because no one could do those miracles except God was there working with them or teach the way that he taught. Howbeit, no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. In other words, for fear of the Jewish leaders. So here when they talk about the Jews, and this is kind of like saying, oh, the White House. You know, the White House uh, came out with a statement. Obviously, it wasn't the White House itself. It was the president. It was the uh, uh, cabinet in the White House, Department of Defense, whatever. Like, people were in agreement in the White House. So here it says, fear of the Jews. They mean the Jewish leaders. It's not they were afraid of all of the Jews. Because Christ had a very large following amongst the majority of the common man Jew. Like, uh, it was really the Jewish leaders and a very small band of followers that had caused so much trouble for Christ. Then we see that again nowadays. We have a huge society and every continent on earth besides Antarctica. And in these societies, you usually have a huge majority of people who are doing what they think to be right. They're doing good things. They're taking care of their families. They're uh, holding to their traditions. They're respecting others and whatnot. And then you have a small little contingent of people who will take the full advantage of the fact that a great majority of people are are kind and, and appreciating and, and um, meek in order to take full control and cause trouble. And so we see that among the Jewish leaders. And we see that, and this kind of leads into what we were talking about yesterday when we were saying that when he was at the feast, but people were marveling because he's like, is this not the person that the Jews were looking to kill, that the Jewish leaders were looking to kill? And how is it that he's so learned in letters? And again, this is one of those things that the brethren of Jesus, his immediate family, couldn't appreciate because they had grown up with it. They had become, <clears throat> in a sense, kind of numb to Christ's ability and knowledge. To do these things. And it's one of those opportunities for us to kind of look into ourselves and say, okay, how do I treat that which is divine every day? Every day that we wake up and the sun is shining, that is a gift from our Heavenly Father. Do we treat it as though it's a burden to wake up? Sometimes there are bad things in life that happen to us. Of course, I have depression. I know that things a lot of times seem way worse than what they actually are. But the fact of the matter is that just waking up every day is a miracle. It's a miracle of her Heavenly Father. It's a miracle of, of the bodies that we have, that we can sit there and go to sleep and our body enters into this hibernative state and we wake up. And it's one of those things that it's like these everyday miracles, these everyday testimonies of the divinity of our Heavenly Father and His love for us can easily go to the wayside if we don't have place in our heart to accept it. So my invitation is for you to take into account how you handle the divine things in your life every day and to make more room in your heart to be accepting of those divinities, those divine testimonies of Christ. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me today, and I will talk to you tomorrow.